Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Tracy Nguyen, and I'm the training manager at the California School-Based Health Alliance. Welcome to our Vaping, Nicotine, and Cannabis, a Briefing for Schools webinar. We're excited to have you all here today. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started with some basic housekeeping, but first we want to make sure we are um, thanking our funder. So we gratefully acknowledge the support of the California Department of Education Tobacco Use Prevention Education Program for this project, and the contents do not necessarily reflect the position or policy of the CDE. And so for our other housekeeping items, this webinar is being recorded. You should have received the recording um, pop up already. Um, and the recording and slides will be shared with you all, as well as the rest of our list of registrants for those who are unable to come um, during this time today. It will also be on our website as soon as we're able to put it up. So we ask for your patience until then. Um, but if there's any questions at all throughout this webinar, please feel free to put it in the Q&A tab, which you can locate at the bottom of your Zoom menu bar, or you can also put it in the group chat as well. Um, and our presenter will be answering them throughout the uh, webinar, but also there will be a dedicated Q&A time towards the end of this webinar as well. Um, and if you don't already know about the California School Based Health Alliance, but we are a statewide nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the health and academic success of children and youth by advancing health services in schools. And so really, our work is based on two basic concepts. It's really healthcare should be accessible and where kids are. And also schools should have the services needed to ensure that poor health is not a barrier to learning. And so we do this primarily through capacity building, technical assistance, and then providing workshops and webinars like the one we're doing today. And if you're interested in learning more about just our work in general and also finding other additional resources, you can always um, click on this uh, website link right here. And I'll also put it in the group chat for you um, where you can find additional recording slides and other resources um, if you'd like to look into that. So let me just go ahead and do that right now. Um, and also, I'm going to go ahead and drop in the webinar web page as well. So there we go. Y'all should have received that. Awesome. And so just a little bit more about us. Um, but if your organization is not already a member, please consider joining. There are benefits like conference registration discounts and also technical assistance tailored to your organizational needs. We'd love to have you all as members. And I'll go ahead and drop that um, link in the chat as well. Here we go. Okay, there we go. Okay, so just really quickly, I want to make sure I'm introducing our presenter. Um, but today we have here with us Stephen Lambert. He is the prevention coordinator at the Orange County Department of Education, and he has 17 years of experience in substance use prevention, positive use development, family and community engagement, and developmental asset building. And in his role at OCDE, he supports schools and districts with training and technical assistance around alcohol, tobacco, and other drug prevention. And today he'll be sharing a little bit more about, you know, updates on current research and emerging trends relating to vaping, nicotine, and cannabis products. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to you, Stephen. So let me go ahead and stop my screen share here. Perfect. Good morning. Thank you, Tracy, for the introduction. And good morning to everybody, especially all my Tupi colleagues across the state. Um, I'm really happy to be here uh, to share a little bit about the current trends and some of the resources that we can all use uh, in our Tupi programs, things that I found helpful. Uh, so some of you maybe are newer to Tupi. Welcome. Some of you a little bit more experienced. So some of it you'll be familiar with, but I can pretty much guarantee there'll be some new stuff in here, regardless of your experience level. So as we head back into the school year, um, I want you all to be equipped with a few things. So let's review today's learning objectives. First of all, um, by the time you're done with this webinar, you'll be able to identify current vaping, nicotine, and cannabis products, what they look like, what's the landscape. You'll be able to explain key facts and health risks to students and families. And you'll be able to evaluate resources to support prevention, intervention, and cessation. I also want to just say in advance, thank you to everybody who posed their questions uh, when they registered. Hopefully, I'm able to address some of those. I incorporated some of it into my content as well. So with that, let's jump right in and start talking about the current product so that we have an idea of the landscape. So let's start with nicotine salt vaping. So this is the one that I think most people are, are interested in, uh, that we're seeing a lot, and that you might have questions about with the functionality of these devices. So 
To get us started, as I always do, I will play a short video from the FDA explaining how vaping devices work. Again, just, and as some of you know this already, this is just baseline knowledge. While they may look different, e-cigarettes are all designed to work in similar ways. When someone puffs on the mouthpiece, a battery heats up a liquid contained inside the device. This liquid then turns into an aerosol that is inhaled. The aerosol resembles a vapor. Depending on the device, e-cigarette aerosol may appear as a thick cloud or be barely visible. But all e-cigarette aerosols are a mixture of chemicals, some of which are known to be harmful. So again, when you are using a vaping device, there's no combustion, there's no burning, there's no smoke. What is coming out of the tip of this device is an aerosol. Um, now, what is creating the aerosol is this liquid inside the vaping device, right? So the base of e-liquid or vape liquid, vape juice is propylene glycol and or vegetable glycerin, PG or VG, as you might hear them called. This is kind of just the clear goopy syrup that forms the base of e-liquid. In that liquid is placed artificial flavors like cherry, strawberry, cinnamon, vanilla, um, and then of course, nicotine, right? Because that is the point of these devices to deliver nicotine into the lungs through that aerosol. So nicotine salt specifically, I, I wanna take just a second to explain this um, because you all probably noticed uh, for the last seven years, essentially, vaping looked a lot different than it did back in the day. We started with the vape pens and the tanks and the mods, then suddenly they got really small and really strong. And it was because of the introduction of nicotine salt. So nicotine salt liquid um, adds an acid with the nicotine in the solution. So in some cases, benzoic acid, there's different ones. Um, but the purpose of that, the purpose of adding the acid is to change the pH. So nicotine itself is alkaline or basic. That means that it's got kind of a high pH, right? So the more nicotine you would add into the old style vape liquids, the more unpleasant it would be. It would really irritate your throat, just not pleasant. You're essentially chemical burning your throat. So by adding an acid, uh, the developers of Juul realized they could change the pH, lower it, and make it less irritating, despite the fact that they were cramming a lot of nicotine in there. So nicotine salt then enabled very high nicotine levels. A high nicotine e-cigarette back in the day might have been 1.6% um, or 16 milligrams per milliliter. So a little note there, packaging, you might see percentage, that's the equivalent. Whereas nicotine salts typically now are 50 milligrams per milliliter. You usually see it written as 5%. Now, side note, um, the UK, the EU, Canada, Australia, all limit sales to 2% nicotine. So do with that what you will. But anyways, 5% uh, is now the market standard. And you can see it's quite concentrated. Now, I also want to point out, this is not some niche thing. This is an exception. If you look at sales over time from 2017 to 2022 here, you can see that yellow bar, which represents 5% or greater nicotine strength, increasing and taking over and dominating, right? So you can see this is not some fringe thing. 5% is absolutely the standard out there in the industry. So by enabling this high nicotine strength, right, we changed the marketplace of vapes. So it started with the Juul which was based on pods, right? So these pods that were filled with the liquid, you'd swap them out when they were empty. We moved on to refillable because people figured out, oh, that's really expensive. But also there were some crackdowns on the pods. And some of those crackdowns on flavored pods led to this loophole of disposable vapes. So you all remember the puff bar way back in the day. And the whole purpose of that was to circumvent some of the restrictions on flavored pods. So everyone picked up these disposables. Now, these are not, puff bars are obviously out of date. Um, we are currently in the plastic blob era. So that's my technical term for where we're at right now. Today's disposable nicotine salt vapes are rounded plastic blobs with a USB port that hold massive amounts of nicotine salt liquid. So these are, a, again, a little bit old, one to two years older. You can see the one on the right, the Elf bar. That's probably the most notorious vape of the last few years because of its popularity. But again, all kinds of shapes and sizes. This is just an example of a haul here of uh, different vapes. You could see lots of different colors, but essentially, yeah, they're all rounded plastic blobs. I'll show you some of the newer iterations uh, in a minute. But before we do that, uh, 
think to yourself, how much nicotine do you think is in one of these elf bars, right? If you had to take a guess, you don't have to write it down, but just think about it. How many cigarettes worth of nicotine? We all remember the, the jewel pods being a, a pack of cigarettes, right? Well, because of the volume of these devices and unbelievably they keep getting bigger. Oh, okay. All right, so we've got, we've got some guesses in here. Yeah, too much, Derek. Absolutely, that's the most accurate answer. Um, so cigarettes, just to give you a baseline knowledge here, cigarettes de uh, deliver one milligram. They contain more, but they deliver one milligram of nicotine each. This Elf Bar contains 650 milligrams and can deliver about half of that. Vapes are really efficient at delivering the nicotine salt from the liquid into the aerosol and into your lungs. So keep in mind, right, this is an extremely efficient way to deliver nicotine. It is not harsh. It is very affordable. We're talking 15 bucks for these devices, right? So we now find ourselves in the situation because of the design of these devices. So what are our key takeaways? I'm going to pause here, do some key takeaways. As I'm doing that, if you have some questions already developing, please drop them into the chat. So some of the key takeaways to, to recap, number one, how these things work, e-cigarettes or vapes heat up a liquid to release an aerosol that carries nicotine into the lungs, no combustion. Second, today's vapes use nicotine salt to deliver very high levels of nicotine with deceptively little harshness. And finally, most common vapes are disposable. I keep putting scare quotes because they're actually e-waste and plastic waste and hazardous waste and hold large amounts of nicotine liquid. So this is the current state of nicotine vaping. Again, I'll, I'll show you some of the newer, newer developments later, but this is the key. All right. So keep, again, if you have questions coming up, let me know, uh, but let's jump in and talk about nicotine pouches. This is the second product category that we're going to talk about. Um, and to kick this off, I'm going to share a brief excerpt from a video from the Wall Street Journal. These are Zen nicotine pouches. The oral nicotine product comes in these cans. You may have seen them for sale in convenience stores, gas stations, and even your local pharmacy, or on social media, where they've birthed a devoted subculture. Good morning, boys. Popping a little. Over the past year, sales of Zinn have skyrocketed. In the fourth quarter of 2023, 116 million cans were sold in the U.S., a 78% increase over the same period a year earlier. Zinn is definitely having a moment. Pouch packed with problems. But Zinn's remarkable success has provoked a backlash and thrust it into the culture war. Many people see it as a threat. So that's an inter it's a very long video. I highly recommend that you check out the entire thing. So you'll be able to do that through the slides. Um, but really just setting the stage for what these things are and the different iterations and places that they're showing up, because you've probably seen these at the gas station. So let me describe and define what these pouches are and how they work. So this Zin or nicotine pouches are the latest iteration of smokeless tobacco products, right? So they follow very closely from what already existed. So we had snuff, chew, or dip, right? Which was tobacco leaf, which you would tuck again between your lip and your gum to absorb the nicotine. Then we moved on to snus, which came from Sweden, um, which changed it so you didn't have to spit anymore. And then nicotine pouches do not actually contain tobacco leaf, but nicotine powder. Sometimes it is synthetic. Sometimes it is derived from nicotine. So in these pouches, there's just nicotine powder, some flavorings, sweeteners, uh, fillers and preservatives, and then basically baking soda to adjust the pH, this time in the other direction. So you're adding, I know it's it's confusing, I'm not going to get into the chemistry, um, but these pouches have no tobacco leaf inside of them. I want to review some of the terminology that you may hear um, when we're talking about pouches. So Zin is basically synonymous with nicotine pouches. As many people say, it's the Kleenex of nicotine pouches because of their market dominance. So people just call them Zins. Pillows, lip pillows, gum cushions, right? Just because of the way that they look and where you place them. Then over on the right, upper deck and lower deck just refers to if you're tucking it under the upper lip or the lower, lower lip. Now, those of you who have a sports background recognize those terms from baseball. Um, there's a lot of connection between baseball, even student athletes now, um, and smokeless tobacco, including Zins. So just be aware of that. Now, these are sort of the big four. These are the big four of nicotine pouches here in the US. Uh, these are the brands. So Zin, as we've talked about already, On, Velo, and Rogue. There are others as well, but these are kind of the big four. 
Now, when you see these brands, because you've probably seen them at the gas station, you're probably wondering, where are they coming from? Is this like some sort of health product? But if I put their parent companies up there, I think it becomes clear who is making these and who is marketing them, right? So we've got our... Our old, uh, our old familiar friends here, um, big tobacco companies are the ones behind these pouches. So do not be mistaken. These are not being promoted as cessation products or health products. They are being mar developed, manufactured, marketed, and sold by big tobacco. So let's play spot the nicotine pouches here. This is a Reynolds American product portfolio. Did you spot it? Yeah, there it is. But it blends right in. Right. So again, be aware, these are tobacco products. Now, Zinn, as I mentioned, is dominating. And this is even just a couple of years back. You can see that yellow line on the top representing Zinn, just dominating the other three brands. Uh, but pouch sales continue to skyrocket year over year. Um, this is from the last quarter, actually. So Philip Morris International saying that they were set to maybe sell 580 million cans of Zin in one year, um, which is a huge increase from the year before um, and increasingly uh, allocating part of their profit. So these are selling, these are making them a lot of money, um, and it is absolutely a big tobacco product. So how much nicotine is in these things? Well, uh, there are studies, unfortunately, many of which are industry funded, but there are a few that are not. Uh, and the general consensus is that using one six milligram pouch, which is pretty common uh, for about an hour, will deliver about as much nicotine as up to three cigarettes, um, although more slowly. So it doesn't peak as quickly as it does with smoking or vaping. Um, it introduces it to the bloodstream more slowly, but then it stays there, kind of hangs out there. Um, and Many people keep it in their mouth for a long time. Supposedly, you're supposed to do like 20 to 30 minutes. An hour is pretty typical for a lot of people. So you can imagine you sell these things in tens of 15. If somebody's swapping these things out every hour, you can be uh, putting a lot of nicotine into your body, perhaps without realizing it. Just a quick note about oral health. So they can irritate the gums, cause dry mouth, things like that. Um, no one knows obviously what the long-term effects are on oral health or dentistry. Um, so it remains to be seen. We know with smokeless tobacco what the impact is, which is devastating. <laughs> To give you a sense of how common these are, because you may be wondering, are young people actually using these? This is from the California Youth Tobacco Survey, the latest one, um, showing the nicotine pouch use percentage among high school students that were sampled. Uh, and you can see the light blue bars are 2022 and the dark blue are 2023. So about 3.1% last year said that they had ever tried it. And 1.1% of high school students in California said they were had used it in the last 30 days. Right. And that doesn't sound like much, but when you see that it's increasing, which is statistically significant, despite it being low, it is cause for concern. More cause for concern is when you put it up against the other tobacco products. So you can see vapes up there in position one. Ranked second is cigarettes, followed by nicotine pouches. So nicotine pouches are increasing and about to pass cigarettes in terms of prevalence, right? So this is something we need to take note of and we need to be aware of because we don't want to be caught unaware and not informed of the issue. Now, there's a lot that I could talk about when it comes to the marketing and the, and the labeling and the things like that. Um, but one thing that I want to talk about and focus on for a minute is tobacco-free nicotine. So if you look at the labels on these pouches and a lot of products, honestly, you will see things like tobacco-free nicotine or tobacco leaf-free nicotine, right? And this is not a mistake. This is a very intentional thing uh, to be aware of with tobacco product packaging. And it is something called a health halo. So some of you may be familiar with this term, but essentially when you put phrases or terms on a product label that are associated with health, it makes you think something's healthier even if it's not, right? So you've got all natural, plant-based, keto-friendly, right? You put that on a put that on a salad, right? Suddenly, oh yeah. It, it makes things seem more healthy than they are. Now, yeah, it's a good thing they haven't figured out how to do that with tobacco products, right? Oh, wait, no, yeah, they have. Well, the unfortunate thing is that this stuff works. Health halos and putting these labels like tobacco-free nicotine do work. 
because research has found over and over now that youth and young adults rate products that have tobacco-free nicotine as less harmful, more likely to purchase, less addictive, right? So just having that phrase on a product makes it seem less harmful. And this is a problem, right? Because it's more likely that they will then initiate using them. Not helping us in this is that there are, and yes, I can't believe I have to say this word, Zinfluencers, um, who are social media influencers, podcasters, talking about nicotine pouches and how great they are and how they help them relax and be productive uh, and live their lifestyle. Uh, and even you can see on the right, lose weight. So some very problematic health messages from very prominent streamers, podcasters, um, so just be aware that young people are being exposed to this kind of messaging um, on a lot of digital platforms. And there's actually a video in the slides you'll be able to watch that I did not play here because I don't want to get a copyright strike. But please check out the slides and watch that video once you get the slides because you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, with regard to regulation, you may be wondering, wait, aren't these a tobacco product? Kind of. So they are not FDA approved for cessation or as modified risk tobacco products. Uh, they did submit their PMTAs, their pre-market um, authorizations to the FDA four years ago, and they are still under review. So do with that what you will. Um, and they are classified as tobacco products here in California, right? So they're essentially being sold under the assumption that they are less harmful um, and they're being permitted to be sold throughout the country. So again, do it that what you will. Um, now, the other thing is you notice that that one says cool mint, right? And you're thinking, aren't we, don't we have a flavor ban here in California? But in California, you'll see things like Zin Chill, which again, what flavor is chill? And they're using a lot of those sort of cooling compounds that are not exactly menthol. Some of you may have heard about these things. Uh, it's more like a sensation or <laughs> sensation, if you will. Um, so it's really unclear what the final regulation will look like on banning these sort of chill sensations and things like that for Zen. Um, but they're still out there. You will see these things sold all over the place. All right. So I know there's a couple of things coming in the chat. I want to check those, but please keep your questions coming and we'll review some key takeaways. All right. So nicotine pouches, what are the key messages here? Number one, Zin and other nicotine pouches. How they work is they contain nicotine powder and then they are held between the lip and the gum and then slowly absorb nicotine into the bloodstream. Number two, tobacco companies are exploiting the label tobacco-free nicotine to make pouches seem safer. They're also doing that with vapes and other things as well. Finally, or not finally, but next, social media's influencers are rampant um, and pouches have been in regulation limbo for years. So let's see where this goes. All right, let me take a peek at the chat and the Q&A because I did see a couple of things coming in. So there's some questions about the side effects of isolated nicotine and going over the side effects. Yes. So I know it seems like I'm only focusing on the products right now because I have one section following cannabis in which I'm going to review the health risks because they tie into nicotine and THC in general, regardless of the delivery methods. So I wanted to keep all of that kind of contained. So that's why I'm just talking about the products themselves right now. So don't worry, we are going to get to that. That is part two. All right. So please keep your questions coming. Now, I want to turn our attention to cannabis. Um, as we all know, there's a lot of co-use of cannabis and nicotine and tobacco products, right? They all run in the same circles. There's some, some additional regulatory weirdness happening uh, between the two product categories. So again, baseline knowledge, How what is cannabis or sometimes marijuana? These are preparations of the cannabis plant that deliver cannabinoids like THC and CBD into the body. Um, THC, again, being the psychoactive one, CBD is not psychoactive, has other effects. I think I was seeing, uh, reading something about roughly 6,000 chemicals being isolated from cannabis uh, as of now. <laughs> So again, THC and CBD are called cannabinoids. So they attach to our nerve cells. They affect all kinds of things throughout our brain and body. Um, I put a, a, just a map there of some of the receptor uh, concentrations throughout the body. And 
it's really a lot of things, memory, sleep, appetite, just tons of places. And this can help explain why people's reactions to cannabis can be so different and why it's such a complex drug and why we have to really be nuanced about our discussion of it and why it can be difficult to have those conversations with young people because we can't make absolute statements about what exactly will happen to someone when they use cannabis. There are so many variables. So how cannabis is used, most often, of course, inhaling it through smoking or vaping, consuming it in food and drinks, and finally absorbing it through the skin, like lotions, things like that, or under the tongue uh, in preparations. But again, that's less common. More common is the inhalation and consumption in food and drinks. I won't spend too much time on edibles since I think a lot of you are pretty familiar with them. Uh, the only things that I'll mention are if you can make it into food and drink, they've probably put cannabis concentrate in it. Um, they are quite strong. You can get like chocolate bars with a thousand milligrams of THC. That wasn't really possible back in the day when they were just putting the bud into edibles. But since they are putting concentrated cannabis in there, you can increase the dose quite significantly. Um, the other thing that I'll mention about edibles is that it is pretty common for people to take more than they intend to because of the delay and the effect. Because you don't feel it due to digestion for 30 minutes, an hour or so, uh, many people will dose more than they should or more than they intended to, I should say. And then you do have that greening out, uh, which can be very unpleasant uh, and re result in some really nasty side effects effects, hallucinations, um, it requires sometimes a trip to the ER. So we've all seen that occurring um, even on school campuses. So that is one of the unfortunate things about edibles. Now, THC vapes, you can see some of the examples here of what they might look like. Um, the pod vapes like Stizzy, they, they're still out there. Uh, Stizzy is basically the jewel of cannabis vapes. Those are pod-based cannabis. Um, now, in the middle are the cartridges or the carts. Those were really notorious uh, a few years ago during a volley because many people who were becoming ill were buying these cannabis cartridges and they were bootleg and had nasty additives in there. Um, but you can see they just attached to a regular vape pen battery. And then over on the right are, again, disposable or what they call in the cannabis side of things, all-in-one products. Uh, those are just some brand example, fried dimes and blinkers. Um, but again different shapes and sizes and the product categories are evolving. They do make like disposable stizzies, for example. So what is in all of those devices is essentially the same substance, which is concentrated cannabis, right? So how much THC is in these things? As you can imagine, just like we saw with the jewel pot or with the nicotine salts, there's a lot. So if you go back in time to 2003, uh, the average cannabis bud strength was 7%. 10 years later, it was 12%. The dispensaries are routinely in the 20% 20, 20 or so. I looked at a couple of studies finding averages around that. Um, and then the pods and the concentrates are typically in the 80 plus percent range. Um, so it's, it's not atypical to have a 90%, 95% THC. And it's just because of the way that they manufacture it. They are purposely processing the buds to concentrate the THC out of it chemically. So that is why it has such a high percentage. So these are very strong products. All right, so keep your questions coming. What are the key takeaways for cannabis? What are these products? So number one, cannabis products, different products deliver cannabinoids like THC and CBD, which can affect many body functions. The delayed effects of edibles often lead to ex excessive consumption and greening out. And both cannabis vapes and edibles can deliver extremely high doses of THC. All right, so that is, those are the basics of cannabis. I am, before we move into the risks, going to cover some less common products that you may have seen or heard. Um, and let me check the chat right now. All right, let's see here. Chat and Q&A. Okay. Delta 8 and Delta 9. All right. I'm actually going to talk about that in two slides, and I didn't pay them to put that question in. Uh, blah, blah, blah. How do you talk about cannabis with a student if they cite that it isn't that bad because it's natural or that it's legal at 21? All right, we'll cover that after the risk section. Are pouches being taxed accordingly? To my knowledge, they are. Um, I, I Again, I haven't checked, but um, I would assume that since they're classified as a tobacco product, they are. Uh, oh, okay, so that was the same question. All right, we'll keep those questions coming because now we're going to move into 
the other products section before we move on to the risks. So before I do that, um, I want to emphasize that some of the products that I'm going to show you do not represent the typical vape being used by young people, right? I don't want to get caught up in, you know, all, all of these things are what you should be looking for. Um, the ones that I've shown you already are a lot more common, but it is important to be aware of what's at the cutting edge because some of these things, yeah, they will show up on campus uh, and we need to be aware of them. All right. So the first section here is barely regulated smoke shop products. This is what I call the, I can't believe it's not cannabis collection. So you have CBD vapes over on the left, um, which are starting to look very much like the THC vapes and other vape products. So they contain CBD um, instead of THC, usually derived from hemp instead of from cannabis, since hemp was legalized a few years back. The second category, and somebody had mentioned it in the chat, is the hemp-derived uh, THC products. So there are hemp-derived um, Delta-8, Delta-9, and 10 uh, products, as well as hexahydrocannabinol, which is HHC. There are other variants of uh, cannabinoids as well. I won't get into all the chemistry, but basically you can process the, the CBD from hemp into psychoactive cannabinoids, like different versions of THC. So they're marketing and selling those products. Um, what's interesting here, and I'll drop it into the chat, hopefully this works is that literally uh, a couple, a week or so ago, Governor Newsom did a big press conference um, and was talking about cracking down on this and issuing some emergency regulations um, for that. So hopefully some of these things will become a little more closely regulated. Now that last one over on the right, somebody actually brought to our attention um, through the questions in preparation for the webinar. So thank you to whoever was asking about that. So they do make mushroom vapes now. Um, this is not the classic psilocybin that you're thinking of, the psychedelic psilocybin uh, mushrooms. This is an Amanita muscaria mushroom, uh, which is psychoactive, but is different. Um, and these are technically not a controlled substance. I'm going to put a little link in here in case you're interested. Um, they are not controlled, so they're selling this stuff alongside particularly CBD and cannabis products. So yeah, this is Abanita muscaria. It's not uh, the psilocybin mushrooms. All right. This one is, I call this the health influencer collection. These are supplements, vitamins, and essential oils. So melatonin vapes, uh, the middle one is caffeine, vitamin B12, and amino acids. And then over on the right, some of you have seen these, and I know we've been talking about these in the 2B world, like monk and fume, which are essential oil vapes and devices, some of which are not even powered. Like the fume, you just kind of puff on it. It's just like a wicked oil. Um, so again, the health benefits or hazards of using these, uh, I guess we'll find out, but there's not a lot of science to suggest that this is a safe way uh, to take in uh, supplements, vitamins, and essential oils. This is, I call this the now with extra e-waste collection. So we've talked about disposable vapes and how they're these different forms of waste. Well, now the latest trend is throwing a screen into the disposable vape. So like the geek bar pulse on the left, you can sort of track the battery power, things like that. The one in the middle is a smartphone built into the vape. And the one on the right is a video, a, like retro video games, arcade games built into the side of the vape. It feels like, you know, exhibit's going to show up and put a screen in your vape. But anyways, so this is uh, one of the newer things that you'll see out there with the disposable vapes. And this final category is, um, you know, letters from the FDA collection. So you have uh, the Minions on the left. My four-year-old would love that. Super Mario Disposables, the highlighter that we all saw. So again, just, just the point here is that these aren't the typical product that young people are using, but this industry just continues to evolve, continues to find new ways to target young people, to create things that are going to spark interest and be all over social media and make lots of really questionable health claims at the same time. So again, our key takeaways, online retailers and smoke shops are the frontiers, right? For all these new products, unverified health claims, slow and consistent regulation is definitely causing a cat and mouse game where something will pop up, they'll regulate it, and then it goes away and a new thing takes its place. And a point to make for young people in particular is that quality control and safety are not guaranteed. There are a lot of issues around like the Delta 8 stuff uh, with contamination and fraud and corner cutting and faked lab certificates. So 
This is not a clean marketplace. You are rolling the dice. It is not as safe and pristine as some people may believe. All right. So let's see. We had a couple of things come in the chat. All right. Oh, so somebody had fentanyl mixed in with cannabis. Oh, man. All right. And then, okay. So I covered that. All right. So now I've covered all of the different product categories. In our next section, as I promised, we are going to talk about the health risks. And as we do that, I want to begin by saying it's very important to frame our discussion properly. When we are in the classroom speaking with young people, it's important that we, or in other settings, I should say, it is important to recognize the context of students' lives, right? Our goal, stay focused on our goal, right? Enabling youth to make healthy decisions based on accurate information, right? This isn't about right or wrong. This isn't about morality. This is about health decisions. It's not about adults. It's not about you know family members, things like that. Because what we have to do here is make sure we're not accidentally alienating students who may have family members who are using these products for whatever reason, or are maybe even working in um, a dispensary, in a vape shop, or even a convenience store, right? A gas station. We don't want to unintentionally shame students and try and differentiate the industry from the industry, right? People just trying to make a living is different than these companies and manufacturers who are weaponizing these products to create addiction. So I do think it is important to be mindful of our approach um, and always focus on youth and healthy decisions, accurate information. So with that said, let's jump in. The big thing, right? Whether we're talking about nicotine or THC, however it is delivered, our biggest priority is the brain. And there is just endless research on the impact of these drugs on so many things, but particularly learning, attention, and memory, right? As people involved in the school setting, this is our core concern. Um, the other thing is that both of these drugs are definitely more addictive to teen brains. Tons of research supporting that. Uh, particularly during times of stress, right? So stress interacts with the teen brain to make either of these drugs more rewarding and addictive, which is a problem because as we all know, the number one reason that young people say they engage in vaping in particular or cannabis is to relax or relieve stress and anxiety, right? So we have a really bad combination of intent and narrative around these things as stress relievers and the fact that we know that this can derail their brain's response to stress. Um, you could see there, there are other, um, other mental health effects of vaping and cannabis use. It's not just the self-medication aspect, right? You might think, oh, well, they're just using these to cope with their feelings, but it is bi-directional, right? So there are longitudinal studies finding the introduction of these drugs can worsen symptoms over time. So it is complex, but overall just bad news to combine uh, mood disorders and stress with vaping and cannabis. High THC cannabis in particular, uh, there's more findings around an increased risk of addiction of cannabis-induced psychosis and even the persistent vomiting, which again, thankfully, pretty rare, but back in the day just straight up did not exist in the public consciousness. Um, so the high THC products, we're going to see more and more research about the impact of them and how it differs from the cannabis of back in the day. But let's talk a little bit more about the aerosol. All e-cigarette aerosols are a mixture of chemicals, some of which are known to be harmful. Some of these substances are in the liquid, such as nicotine, the same highly addictive chemical in tobacco, and chemicals used to flavor the aerosol. These flavor chemicals can be harmful to the lungs when inhaled. Some of the chemicals in the aerosol are created when the e-cigarette liquid is heated. These can include acrolein, a potentially harmful chemical also used in weed killers. If that's not enough, some e-cigarette aerosol also contain toxic metals. So think about it. When someone vapes, they can be exposing their body to a number of harmful chemicals. So when we talk about the aerosol, first, I think it's important to help people understand what that is, because when you see someone blowing a cloud out, it appears like it just disappears, that it's made of nothing. But an aerosol, what that is, is a mixture of tiny liquid droplets and solid particles, right? So this isn't something that just evaporates into nothing. There are particles in there. It's just very hard to see. They're microscopic. When we talk about the chemicals in aerosol, I believe that precision is very important because when they talk about formaldehyde or acrolein or things like that, it might be natural to assume, oh, maybe they're adding that in, like they're adding that to the e-liquid and students will dispute that 
accurately because they are not being added in, right? What is happening is the byproducts of the heating process. So PG and VG, right? When you heat them up, they can form toxins, uh, especially when they're inhaled, right? So the formaldehyde, the acrolein, those come from the thermal breakdown of PG and VG. The higher you turn the heat, right? If you're dripping, you're hitting blinkers, right? You're doing cloud chasing competitions. You see the, mo the most of that development or dry hits, right? When you're trying to get that last drop out, um, you see a lot more of that happening. The other thing is the flavoring. So strawberry, cinnamon, you know, popcorn, things like that. Uh, those are very safe when eaten, but not safe to heat up and inhale. That's where you can see a lot of tissue damage, things like that, toxicity of those flavorings. They're not meant to be breathed in. What's safe to eat is not necessarily safe to eat, uh, safe to breathe. The other piece is the coil. So again, these work by heating up the liquid and turning it into an aerosol. They're cheaping out, right? We heard about like the Stanley Cup thing with the lead solder. They're absolutely using the cheapest metal parts they can find uh, to generate that aerosol. And so time and time again, research finds metals leaching into the liquid, into the aerosol and into the body of people using them. They'll do, you know, they'll examine the urine and they will see metabolites and metals in there. So it is making its way into the body and it is not something you want to be inhaling over the long term. So somebody was, oh, sorry. Uh, in case you were wanting PG and VG, I caught that. Propylene glycol and vegetable glycerin. So when we talked about what was in the e-liquid, that is the base that forms it. If you've seen like fog machines, that's basically the same stuff, propylene glycol in particular. Um, that's basically what they're using. So it's you basically have a fog machine in your face. Um, so... Somebody had asked about isolated nicotine. Yes. So this is important, right? Because the entire premise, particularly of vapes, was there's no combustion. There's no smoke. There's no carbon monoxide. There's no tar. Surely then this will not affect cardiovascular health or at least be not as bad as cigarettes. So that's the narrative. More and more research now finding, well, actually vaping and oral nicotine use, they do directly affect cardiovascular action. So nicotine affects our fight or flight nervous systems, so the sympathetic nervous system. So you do see a boost in blood pressure and heart rate, regardless of intake, wh whichever way you're taking nicotine. Um, and now more and more research is linking vaping with increased risk of cardiovascular disease, independent of smoking. That means that they were not co-using things like that. They're still affecting the, the way that your cardiovascular system works, your heart, your blood vessels. Um, and you can click those articles when you get the slides and follow through and see some of the research behind it. But essentially it's not as um, harmless as people probably hoped. Like it made sense, right? We've seen the devastating impact of cigarette smoking. The hope was, wow, this is maybe gonna unlock something magical, but unfortunately um, that's not really bearing out, especially for young people, right? They're setting themselves up for a lot of risks. The last thing I want to talk about with the risks is uh, the <laughs> attack of the clones is what I call it. Um, we remember back when Juul came out, everybody made a copycat of that. When Puff Bar came out, everybody made a copycat of that. Well, that has just continued uh, through this current generation of vapes, right? Like you remember the Elf Bar showed you. That's not the Elf Bar showed you. This is the Elf Bar showed you. Uh, the first one is a, a counterfeit, but even aside from the counterfeits, there are tons and tons of clones being churned out of these factories by the millions, right? And so you imagine how little quality control there is on these devices. Um, there's even less for the counterfeits. And something that you might not be aware of in young people is that these are actually contraband. These are these can be seized by CBP, um, not by I, not by the capacity building project, by customs. <laughs> I should be clear here what I mean by that. Um, sometimes they do federal enforcement of shipping containers containing these things because these are not legal to sell in the U.S., if you can believe that. Um, so imagine how little consumer protection we have and then just make it worse. So what are our key takeaways for our health risks? <laughs> Thanks, Derek. Um, our key takeaways, number one, nicotine and THC, more addictive to the teen brain. Second, both can affect learning, memory, and attention, can worsen depression, right? So we got to help them develop those positive coping strategies. Third, vaping generates harmful chemicals and metals. That heating process is what introduces those into the aerosol. It's not just clean water vapor. And finally, vaping and nicotine 
affect the heart and the blood vessel. So independent of smoking, um, you do see some of those effects. Oh, I'm sorry. And then lastly, flavored vapes. I covered this already. Are illicit goods not FDA tested? All right, so we'll come to now our helpful resources section uh, with the time that we have left, and then I'll address whatever uh, other questions are coming in. So please keep the questions going in the chat and the Q&A. But I did want to make sure that I leave you with um, some resources that you can use right away um, in your own practice with students and families. So I always think it's nice to present the pyramid of interventions, um, prevention, intervention, and cessation to remind ourselves um, of the framing, right? Most young people trying to make healthy choices, but we do need to address the prevention aspect and invest in that, and then also invest in intervention and cessation proportionally, right? Especially by whatever grade span we're looking at. So prevention curriculum, again, all of my 2P folks out here, this is old hat for you, but in case you're newer to 2P, there are some recommended curricula that we have out there, evidence-based and evidence-informed. Catch My Breath, You and Me Together Vape Free from the Stanford Reach Lab and Smart Talk also from the Stanford Reach Lab. Uh, Multi-session curriculum addressing health risks, coping strategies, the impact on the environment, um, really, really comprehensive, solid curricula. Do check those out at no cost, and they also have no cost trainings as well. There are tons of different parent and caregiver resources, but I find these are a good starting place. So the California Department of Public Health has their Let's Talk Cannabis Toolkit uh, with a lot of those sort of conversation starters for uh, parents and caregivers of, you know, what to say when your young person asks you, did you smoke when you were younger? Things like that. Um, Catch My Breath Toolkit, kind of a similar thing, but for nicotine vaping. And then I want to move on to intervention. So as we do that, I just you know, could... We could do like a three hour on this. I'll spare you all. But I think when we move into intervention, it's important that we keep in the back of our mind how we make the case for using substance use interventions, particularly as an alternative to suspension. And three just quick points I want to make. Number one, suspensions impact attendance and achievement, right? We're concerned about young people. We want them to succeed. And we know that suspension impedes that, right? A significant number of suspensions across the state are related to substance use, like a massive amount. Second, suspension may temporarily relocate substance use, but it does not address the root causes and may worsen the issue. Lots of research finding negative outcomes from suspension. And finally, unlike other suspendable behaviors like bullying, violence, bringing a weapon to school, substance use directly harms the person doing it and does not always have a direct victim. So it's a little more nuanced, right? There's some room here. We also then need to think about, is our response to this behavior, to substance use, addressing these things? Is it helping them build their skills so that they can achieve in school? Does it um, address some of the root causes of substance use and maybe improve their behavior? And does it help them, right? Are we actually helping this young person through this intervention? So I'll get off of my, uh, my uh, what do you call it, soapbox, um, but just, you know, there's some points to make when having this conversation about alternatives to suspension. So there are some options here that we recommend. Um, if you have school staff who are working directly with young people, um, brief intervention, our healthy futures or in depth from the American Lung Association are all programs that you can be trained on to administer with young people in individual or small group formats. We and the Stanford Reach Lab and American Lung have trainings available at no cost that we are sponsoring. Um, and they combine motivational interviewing, stages of change theory, help young people develop their decision-making skills uh, while educating them on some of the risks. So again, this is when you are working directly with young people. There are some self-paced online programs um, that you can build into your intervention plan, into your matrix. So EverFi's Vaping Know the Truth in collaboration with Truth Initiative, My Healthy Futures, which is a self-paced version, of what I presented just now, and then uh, in-depth online, also self-paced. So these are similar. I would say they're uh, particularly vaping know the truth, more focused on some of the health risk aspect, um, a little more like going through an online course than working directly with the counselor, which of course we always recommend. It is a nice complement to their existing counseling sessions. Uh, and when you enroll young people in these self-paced programs, you get you know certificates, you have a dashboard, things like that. 
And all of these, I put a little like link icon because when you get the slides, you can click through and access those directly. And of course, I want to plug two programs from UC San Diego, YVape, which is a telehealth intervention program for vaping and cannabis, for nicotine and cannabis. Um, and you can go to the YVape website, learn all about it. This is a free, again, no cost service that UC San Diego's counselors provide uh, virtually to young people. Uh, and they have two sessions of counseling as well as educational videos. So really highly recommend YVape, check that out. It is at no cost. And they also administer Kick It California, which is, of course, our statewide tobacco cessation program. Uh, and it, I put some of the, like the website, the referral form for students, the flyer, put all of that here on the slides that you can download. In case you want to uh, post some resources that are a little more youth-facing, youth-friendly in your health office or out around campus, things like that, um, we developed on the left, uh, my colleague Celeste uh, Reynoso, uh, and I developed this uh, cessation mini poster to put up in uh, on school campuses with QR codes to some resources from Smoke Free Teen to create your own quit plan, as well as This Is Quitting, which is a text message based cessation program. So they send uh, from professionals and from peers, send tips and support for quitting vaping. And the reasoning behind that um, and the reason that Celeste suggested this entire thing was that many young people. Um, would rather kind of do it themselves, right? They're establishing agency and independence. And so they're not maybe wanting to talk on the phone with a counselor or things like that. And they would rather try and figure it out on their own. So encouraging them to seek these resources to help guide them. And then over on the right is from the Reach Lab. Uh, and that's just a helpful uh, quitting tips for nicotine and cannabis. And so it's just a reminder of uh, things they can do to get started on the journey. Again, you can download that one as well. All right. Yes, I did save myself enough time for questions. I was so worried that I was going to go over and not have any time to answer questions. So I'm going to put this up here. You can scan the QR code to head to a Google Drive folder. And again, you'll, you'll all get these slides um, as a follow-up. I did also put our Tupi California website there in the bottom right corner. That's my email on the left. If you have any questions about, I mean, really anything related to Tupi, uh, just let me know. But with that, I think what I'm going to do is jump into the Q&A and the chat and make sure uh, that we addressed everything. So let me scroll around. So again, add any questions that you have uh, into the chat. Let's see here. Oh boy, let me work backwards. Um, can you say definitively if vape products and cannabis products can contain fentanyl? Okay, so this is an interesting one. Um, I have done a lot of digging about whether you can aerosolize fentanyl, meth, things like that. So you can make a meth vape solution. Um, again, this is not like the typical drug substance use pattern among young people, but you can put meth into a vape product and then vape it. Fentanyl is a little more complicated. I see a lot of um, really contradictory things. A lot of the cases around fentanyl and vaping are cross-contamination. Um, combusting and smoking it, burning it, uh, seems to be the key in terms of delivering fentanyl to the lungs because it has a fairly high temperature that you need to hit. I think it's about 350 Celsius. So it has to be pretty high, higher than most commercial vape products would get. So it does seem, on. I'm not going to say impossible, like I'm not a chemist, I'm not a research chemist. I'm not to say it's impossible to vape fentanyl. It's just, I would be much more concerned about the counterfeit pills and the laced street drugs and things like that. Because I mean, let's be honest, the, the cases that we see among young people, that is the recurring theme. Um, so I think it's important to stay focused on that. And particularly when we talk about vaping, focused on just the direct impact of the drugs we know that they are using already, because we don't want to lose lose sight of that and have them dismiss, think, oh, well, it's just in the nicotine thing. So nothing to worry about. Vape detectors. Oh, so we do have actually a guidance sheet, which I'll include in a follow-up email about vape detectors and some of the potential pitfalls and considerations around them. Uh, through the Tupi program, just want to be clear, Tupi can, funds cannot be used to purchase vape detectors just by essence of the funding. Um, and I believe you'll find uh, opinions all over the place about vape detectors, but we'll make sure to include the vape detector resource in the follow-up email. 
BI for element, uh, brief intervention for elementary age kids. Uh, I don't think that it's evaluated for using with younger students, so I can't speak to that. Um, I will put that question to the trainers, uh, actually maybe tomorrow when they're, <laughs> we're doing a, a statewide training. What can I tell a parent that complains about substance use temptations being more prevalent at school Ooh, rather than at the home? Okay, so I mean, any environment where there are is more than one young person, there's going to be peer influence, right? And so what we're doing is trying our best at the schools to encourage positive norms, positive messaging. We can't control everything that young people come into contact with, but by providing those positive social norms, a supportive environment, and helping them develop skills to resist alcohol and drug use, we're doing what we can to address the issue. Because they are also going to leave the school and leave the home eventually into adulthood. So we have to work in partnership with parents and guardians and caregivers to help develop that mindset among young people. Um, let's see. Okay. Is there a PSA media campaigns for youth cannabis prevention outreach? Oh, uh, no, actually, I have not seen a lot of those um, like PSAs for youth. Have you looked into Galaxy Gas? I do not know what that is. Congratulations. We've got a we've got a new one that I've never heard of. I have to go and look that up now. If, if whoever suggested that, if you want to drop into the chat some info, I'd love to know it. Is there any research to show the ban on flavored tobacco has led to a decrease in teen vape use? Ooh, I do not know. I know that it, we're still pretty early and enforcement is really all over the place. I can say that vaping across the state among young people is decreasing overall. Um, so that that's a good sign. Doesn't definitively mean that this is a result of the flavor ban. Oh, interesting. All right. Well, that's something new for me to look up. I'll be on that now. Uh, engaging students in the education meeting in classrooms. So there are so the prevention curricula that I linked earlier. Um, they have lesson plans and guides and slides and activities that you can use directly with young people right now. So um, again. The way that they develop those things is very thoughtful, standards aligned, uh, and you can use those as models, even if you don't end up using the curriculum themselves as is. Uh, thank you, Sam. She dropped in our vape detector one pager. Uh, da, da. Oh, so, so somebody said, FYI, the student had fentanyl in the cannabis product was confirmed in the ER. Wow. So was it, maybe it was smoked cannabis or maybe vaped cannabis. Um, so it is potentially possible. Again, I, I will not say that something is impossible. I think it is more likely when you're talking about smoking because of that high temperature that it needs to reach to deliver it to the lungs. Um, so yeah, I think that raising awareness of young people's exposure to fentanyl overall is incredibly important. I do think it's important to focus on the fake pills and the street drugs, but you can bring that up as a potential, just be aware that there is contamination right? And that running in circles with people who are selling nicotine and cannabis products, they may also be selling fentanyl, uh, fentanyl containing products as well. So providing them that caution uh, as well, I think is a good idea. All right. Well, thank you all so much. Um, I, again, I'll, I'll include some follow-up resources in the email that goes out. I really appreciate all of your attention um, and the questions and engagement throughout today. I hope I hope it was uh, not too much information at once, uh, but I, I really wanted to cover all of these points. So again, thank you so much for your time. I'm going to turn it over to Tracy. Thank you, Stephen. That was awesome. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen if you can just um, stop your sharing real quick. Thank you. Okay, I did want to make sure I'm leaving you all with some additional um, opportunities. So I wanted to make sure I'm sharing our upcoming webinars. So it's part of our 2P webinar series. Stephen already kicked it off amazingly for us um, with just this current vaping landscape and what it's like. But our next webinar will be on October 9th. It is My Voice Saves Lives, Engaging Young People as 2P Peer Education. So that one really focuses on the nuts and bolts of peer-to-peer -peer education from a 2P lens. And we will have youth presenters. So you'll get to hear about their experiences um, and their recommendations for peer-to-peer -peer work. So hopefully y'all register and I'll put that in the group chat as well. 
And then we also have a November webinar. It's going to be on the triangulum of cannabis, tobacco, and e-cigarette use. So you're interested in learning more on how the use and co-use of cannabis and nicotine can lead to dependence and impact mental health. Stephen kind of already talked about a little bit about this, but it will go in more depth in that webinar. Uh, we do have that. It does share best practices when working with young people as well. I think there was a question regarding that. So if you're interested, please sign up. We'd love to have y'all join us again. And the recording and slides will be shared out with everyone, including those who could not join us today. And it will be shared on our website as well. Um, just hang tight until then. And then I want to make sure I'm thanking you all for joining us here today. And if, again, there's any questions, please feel free to reach out to Stephen or myself. Um, we're happy to answer your questions as they come in. And then there is an evaluation survey at the end of this webinar. It'll pop up automatically when you exit this Zoom webinar. So please fill it out. It's really just six short questions. It'll help us improve our future webinars. And we really appreciate any feedback we can get from you all. But otherwise than that, thank you so much for your time. We hope you have a great rest of your Wednesday and the rest of your week.